Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have this awesome Tudor Prince Oyster Date from the late 1950s. As you can see, it is not in the best of shape. The owner of this watch uh, bought it actually recently as non-working and asked me if I could take a look at it. And it's really cool. It's got a couple of things going on with it. So one, it's not working. Uh, and as you can see, it's got some damage. So it's gonna need a fair bit of work. But two, it has a personal story. You see that rose at the top, that's the Tudor rose. And that was a design element that they used a long time. Uh, they kind of stepped away from it now, but they used it for quite a while. And this, the owner of this watch, Jose, bought this watch in remembrance of his dog. His dog was named Rosie. And unfortunately she passed away this year after a long and happy life. And uh, he wanted to buy this watch as a way to help remember his, uh, his family member that has passed away. And so he asked me if I could take a look at it and see if I could get this thing running. And I thought, this is a cool watch and uh, I'm a huge animal fan. So, <laughs> you know, as a fellow dog lover, I couldn't say no. And that's what we're gonna do here today. We are going to try to get this thing on the wrist of Jose so that he can carry it with him. And whenever he sees that rose on the dial, he'll think of Rosie. So as you can see, <laughs> when he sent it to me, it is not working. And part of the reason is this right here. There were parts literally just in this extra container. And those parts are the balance wheel and the balance bridge, two absolutely critical parts. So the watch is not gonna be a runner, but let's take a look at how the rest of the movement looks inside. All right, that's not too bad, actually. Um, no major depth. You can see it's pretty beat up movement. It's old school. Uh, that You can see it's called an auto prince, which is uh, apparently Tudor's name at the time for the automatic works on this particular model. Um, but yeah, uh, there is no balance. Um, so that's going to be an issue. We can take the crown out here so that we can remove the movement. And before I do, take a look. Yeah, that crown on that. That is the Rolex crown. And of course, for those of you who don't know, Rolex owns Tudor. Tudor is like their little brother brand, the slightly more affordable version. Um, and at the time, they uh, made a lot of the same parts. Ooh, that dial, I love it. Oh, I love it. If you if you uh, watch my videos, you'll know that I, I'm a real sucker for a nice patina dial like that. And, and this one certainly has that going on. It looks awesome. Can replace the crown and the stem here so that I can align the hands for removal as well. So Jose told me that the the balance and the balance bridge were separate. He also mentioned, uh, if you look closely, when I showed you a minute ago, um, that there's no balance spring on the balance. So we're definitely going to need some parts for this watch as well. But he said, you know what? Do what you got to do. It's worth it to me. And uh, we'll probably be, be visiting eBay for some parts for this bad boy. Okay, so the hands are removed. And now we can remove the dial. So I just need to find the dial screws on the side. Which, strangely, there aren't any? Like, how is this dial attached if there's no dial screws? Um, all right, well... Let's uh, take off the automatic winding works here, and that might give us a view into where the dial feet come into the movement. And occasionally on watches like this, the, the dial screws are actually on the movement like a normal screw. And rather than being a screw, they're what's called an eccentric. It just turns and bumps up against the dial feet. So maybe we can see where those dial feet come in. Although I don't. I don't see where the dial feet, I don't understand how this dial is attached. Maybe if I just give it a little, oh, look at that. It actually can pry up. Is it just friction fit in place? Wow, that is bizarre. So there's no dial feet? Nope. <laughs> wow, okay. Well, that's a new one for me. Uh, this must be the way that they did these old tutors, but I have not experienced that before. Uh, good to know. Now we can take off the uh, calendar wheel, which is really cool because as you can see, every other day is red, the, the even numbered days. And that just looks really like visually cool. So we'll take the dial and the calendar and make sure that they're in a safe container. And then wait a minute, <laughs> there's a random jewel sitting here. 
<laughs> that does not belong. Although, oops, now that I think about it, I that looks like a capsule for a balance bridge. I wonder if the one that he sent me is missing that part. Let's take a quick look. Yep. Yep, it sure is. So I'll show you where this goes. This normally would go here. There would also be another part underneath it, but that's where that sits. So that was just floating around, in fact, on the other side of the movement somehow. So, huh, that, that makes me wonder what happened to this watch. Like how in the world did that thing get broken that badly? And then this, this uh, jewel ended up full on on the other side of the movement? Hmm. That is bizarre. I've never seen that before. But uh, we'll have to just forge onward here. We'll take off the uh, the calendar jumper spring. I'm basically just trying to get enough of the calendar taken apart here so that I can get to the cannon pinion so that I can remove it. That'll allow me to remove the train of wheels on the other side when we get to that point. And as it turns out, I took off the whole calendar works. That's a remarkably simple, simple calendar. Here's my Canon pinion removal tool that I got actually off of eBay. And you can see it makes removing the Canon pinion a snap. It's also a safer way to do it. There it is. Everything looks okay so far, except for the random floating parts, but. Okay, so now we can remove the pallet. Normally I would have to remove the balance and the balance wheel, but um, yeah, there isn't one, so. I guess I don't have to do that this time. So we'll remove the pallet fork bridge and the pallet fork itself. Yeah, interesting. So I took it off really quickly there because it looked like it was under some tension and uh, the mainspring wouldn't unwind regularly. So that was why, kind of interesting. Movement feels pretty gunked up. Things aren't really moving freely on this thing. I, I think this is probably in dire need of a, a service. And uh, that's what we're gonna do here. So kind of a two-parter for us here. Um, we have to do our normal watch service on it and kind of see what that gets us. But then also we've got, you know, outright parts missing that need to be replaced. So kind of both of those troubleshooting plus cleaning and everything. All right, so I'm trying to take apart the barrel bridge here, but it's complicated. There seems to be kind of a lot going on. So I'm just going to see what I can remove first and kind of see where that puts me. I'm going to take off the, the click and the, oh, oh, that's interesting. So that click screw is actually way bigger than normal. And that's because it probably goes all the way through that plate and is one of the screws that actually holds that plate down. Normally that's not true, but in this case, it looks like the engineers decided to get a little bit of a two for one out of it. So it holds down the click and then it also helps hold down the plate itself. So that's a smart little twist. Okay, now we can take off the two screws that hold this plate down. And I think, okay, yeah, it's moving around a little bit. So I should be able to remove it. I think. It's a bit of a weird setup. You wanna come out? Yeah, okay. So as you can see, the barrel and the plate are kind of uh, held together here, and then there's a wheel on top, and I don't know, I'm gonna have to figure that out in a little bit. I'm just gonna set it aside for now, and we'll disassemble that after I get the rest of the movement taken apart. And as you can see, everything looks pretty normal otherwise. Now I can, uh, set about taking off the train wheel bridge, which goes over all of the train wheels here in the middle. There's three of them that touch it. There's actually even more train wheels than that, but these are the main ones. Everything looks fine. As you can see, this is a movement that is very well worn, right? The, <laughs> you know, oh, one of the wheels actually stuck in the uh, plate there. And that's usually a sign that the oil has dried up and that the wheel is gonna have a very difficult time spinning. Another good reason to do a service. Okay. And as you can see, I can probably get the escape wheel. Yep, I can take that out. And then there's a little 
mini bridge here that's covering this last wheel. So we'll take that out. But just like that, this whole side's disassembled. So as, you know, daunting as it looked when we first looked at it, it's coming apart okay. Also, no major broken parts noticed yet. So that's good news as well. Because a lot of times you have to just do some guesswork about what may have happened, you know, to a movement like this. Like, why is the balance removed? Why is it in the box? How did that jewel get on all the way on the other side of the movement? And sometimes, you know, you don't really ever get to figure out. Sometimes it's human error. You know, somebody tried to fix it and didn't know what they were doing and kind of made a mess of it. Okay, there's a few parts of the uh, keyless works here that we can get to from this side before flipping the movement back over again to uh, finish taking apart the keyless. But take a look, there's actually not much left on this watch. Again, you know, you, you take it out of the case and there's kind of a lot going on, but this thing came, came apart pretty easily. This is just a little cover plate that covers up the minute wheel. Little baby screws here, though. Those are tiny. It's crazy how they were able to make such small parts. I mean, this watch was made in the 50s, so it's, you know, not as old as some of the pocket watches that I've worked on, but... They man mass manufactured these little tiny parts going back to the 1800s. It's funny, too, because a lot of people have asked... How do they make those little tiny screws? And I was like, I don't know. And I, I looked it up and it's funny. I saw some of the machines that they used to make those and they're massive. <laughs> the machines are like half of a room big and they spit out these little tiny little baby screws. It's really funny. Okay, careful with that one. Good, good, good. And now we can take off the uh, the yoke. And again, you can see this movements, it's been worn <laughs> and it's been worked on a bunch and it's seen better days, but you know, that doesn't mean it can't run well. Okay. So let's take apart the uh, automatic winding works here as well. Curious to see how they did this. You know, this is a medium to high end watch for its time. <clears throat> you would expect this to be, you know, a pretty darn good watch, but the standardization that you see now from Swiss watches and going back even to like the 60s and 70s forward wasn't there yet. Everybody kind of had their own way to do these things. And you can see a lot of weird stuff in here like that. Like, what are these? I mean, I know what these are. These are reversing wheels. These are wheels that have, that are geared basically so that they can spin one way or the other and still wind up the watch, but they look kind of strange. And this too, this is just bizarre. So first, in order to take this apart, there's this little kind of star-shaped holder thing that I have to remove, and I don't want it to go flying away, but at the same time, like, it's just held under tension. Ooh, oh, look at that catch. <laughs> oh, I'm getting good. But uh, yeah, that seems to be what was holding together this uh, this sandwich of, of parts. Let's see if it'll come apart now. Yeah, there we go. One wheel comes off. And that wheel, again, looks pretty beat up, but hopefully functional. And then there's this sort of intermediate shim thing. And then there's the ratchet wheel that goes on top of that. And then that's the plate. And then below that <laughs> is finally the mainspring barrel. And uh, of course, inside of that will, will be the mainspring. And the mainspring is what is responsible to uh, provide power to the watch for any functions that it may have. In this case, the watch uh, has hours, minutes, seconds, and a date. And this one piece of metal that I have to now remove from this little circular part is the thing that powers all of it. That to me is the real genius of these watches is that that piece of metal in my hand is translated into something that can not only keep track of time, but also display it to you. In a, in a kind of beautiful, functional way. It's amazing that they were able to figure this stuff out so long ago. Okay, all the parts need to go into the watch cleaning machine. So first that means, of course, they need to go into these little tiny mesh baskets. And the, the reason for that is simple, so that we don't lose them in the watch cleaning machine. Because they get 
jammed around in there a bunch. But remember, they're submerged in liquid, so it's not like they're hitting up against each other in there. But uh, yeah, so now before we put it in the watch cleaning machine though, let's take a look at the case and do any case prep work that we might need. First, a very, very old gasket, but thankfully it's not cooked on. Sometimes they are. And it looks like it wants to come free in one piece, please. Good. Uh, yes, all right, that's... Super satisfying to have to say, and uh, we'll be replacing that. And uh, now we need to take a look at this crystal and the rest of the case to see what it's doing. Now this tool right here is a bezel removal tool. And it, what it does is it removes the metal bezel around the edge of the crystal, which also, by the way, holds the crystal in place and presses it down to make it more watertight. Now take a look at where it separates here, right there. And this is a gentle way that it hits it from four sides at once rather than one angle, which can create some side pressure that can cause damage. And uh, I've been really pleased with that tool. It does a very good job. Now we can remove the metal bezel. Ooh, yeah, there's some corrosion under there. Let's see if the crystal wants to come out. Yeah, it does, no problem there as well. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, it looks like this crystal hasn't been replaced in maybe ever, at least in a very, very long time. And uh, with the damage on it, we are going to have to replace it. But for now, um, one thing I can do is get a little bit of manual cleaning going here on the bezel area. I'm going to put this case in the ultrasonic cleaner. And that is a, a way to non-abrasively remove dirt and debris and, uh, you know, surface contaminants and stuff like that. But it, it, it since it is non-abrasive, really stuck on dirt like you see here, ooh, Oh yeah, like that. Uh, it has a hard time with that. So I find it works a lot better if you just give it the once over with a piece of peg wood like this or tweezers or something to just sort of break up the, the really stuck on stuff. And then the uh, ultrasonic will do a really good job of taking care of the rest. Okay, so we'll set all these parts aside and they're gonna go in the ultrasonic while the rest of it goes into this. This is the watch cleaning machine. That's the one on the left there. Sometimes I use these two machines in tandem as well. You can use the ultrasonic cleaner as part of your cleaning um, repertoire, you know, uh, and then you can put it into the watch cleaning machine on, particularly on things that are particularly dirty, you need to do that. So while this watch cleans up, I did wanna mention I've got a Patreon for this channel. That's a way that you can support the content creators, the shows on YouTube, the songs, that type of stuff that you really enjoy. If you like what I do here and you wanna support me, it's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. There's a link down below. And everybody who signs up gets a thank you card and a wristwatch revival sticker in the mail. And I really just wanted to say thank you to everybody who supports me there. It means the world and it allows me to continue making videos and I really, really appreciate it. Okay, now we need to put the case and everything into the ultrasonic cleaner. So this is a simple thing. The cleaner has uh, water, which is warmed up by the way, by the machine itself and a detergent of some sort. You can even just, is that thing floating? It is, get down there. And uh, you can even use, Come on, come on. Oh God, I just made, whatever. Uh, <laughs> the bubbles always win, by the way. Uh, I don't know if it's the solution I got, but I never uh, have defeated them. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's a detergent type solution. And then you just leave it in there for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and it'll really do a great job of getting into the nooks and crannies that you really just can't with a brush or, you know, the peg wood or anything like that. So now that that's been all cleaned up, and by the way, you can see there's a bit of dirt now in that water, and that you know came from the watch and maybe something else I had in there prior, I can't remember. And then these just get rinsed off in cold water, and this is what everything looks like when it is finished. There's the whole entire movement all laid out, and as you can see, it is looking a lot better than before all the screws and the cannon pinions and the wheels and everything sitting there ready to be reassembled, which is what we're gonna do right now. So to start things off, we're, we need to reassemble the um, mainspring barrel. And in this case, because this is an automatic watch, that means we need to use what's called braking grease. And that's what's in this um, container here. And what you do is you just put a little tiny bit around the edge of the barrel itself. And what happens is, is the spring rides along that edge and the braking grease helps it not slip. And if it does slip, not, you know, create a bunch of uh, little 
shavings of metal. Now, I found a new a new old stock, as they call it, mainspring for this movement. So this is a good find. I found it on eBay. And that means that I we get to start over with a fresh mainspring with this. And that's, it's not 100% necessary. I definitely could have used the old one. It wasn't damaged or broken significantly. But it is definitely recommended to try to get a new one on a watch this old, just because you'll see better performance and longer lasting performance with it. Who knows how old that mainspring was. Okay, now I can put the uh, arbor back in place. A little bit of lubrication here for where it meets the edge of this cap and it will be good to go. To put the cap back on, I have a little plastic tool that I like to use. You can use tweezers for this, but I find this to be much easier. You just press down on the top and boom, it just clicks it into place by applying even pressure around the rim of that uh, barrel. Okay, so now I guess we just need to fully reassemble this thing. This kind of odd uh, barrel bridge setup that they've got set up here. When it comes to stuff like this, there's a lot of, uh, you know, using best practices, using your brain to kind of say, well, how... How would this thing go back together best? And where might I need some lubricant? Sometimes you can find charts for older movements that will kind of tell you where the manufacturer says to put uh, oil and how much and what kind. But on watches this old, it can be very difficult. And also the practices have changed a bit over time with regards to which oils you use. So you have to kind of substitute some in. So I like, you know, for an old one like this, I'm just going to use my brain and I'm just going to say, well, what makes sense? And what makes sense here, of course, is to use this little clip thing to, oh, there we go, very carefully reinstall this wheel that goes on the top. This is part of the automatic works, by the way. You can, uh, most automatic watches can be wound manually or you can just let them wind themselves by wearing them around. And this one's like that too. There are a few, I know there's a, a popular movement from Seiko that you can't hand wind at all. It's kind of funny. As a result, it has a little tiny crown, <laughs> like the winding, it's tiny. Cause they're like, well, you're not gonna be winding on it. The only thing you use it for is to set the time. And if you wear it every day, you don't really need to do that because it's an automatic. So they made the crown really, really small on that one. It's kind of funny, but. That's not the case here. You can manually wind this watch as well. Okay, so we'll start off with the center wheel. And before I forget, we're gonna put on the setting lever screw because that actually goes underneath this plate. And if you forget to do it, you have to undo everything. Okay, so I guess this thing just goes into place here, sure. Again, I'm kind of making it up as I go. It can be difficult to know exactly how these type of movements go back together. This is a departure from the normal Swiss movements. Again, the, the bones are the same, but the extra stuff is kind of strange. And it looks like I screwed up. <laughs> yeah, I did. So I need to put this wheel in and I can't do it with that other bridge on there already because it has all the other stuff attached to it. So whatever, I'm just going to take it off and start over again with the train of wheels. It's better to just take a breath and kind of start over again than it is to try to force everything together. That doesn't usually end well. And this is an interesting uh, dynamic is that you need all three of these to sit kind of perfectly in their jewel holes. And it's very difficult to actually get them to do it. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm just gently moving these around so that they're all sitting properly. See, that one wants to keep tipping over. Come on, stay there. That's, oh, okay, I tipped it over again. Stay there. That's what I want. And now I can put the bridge on here. And as long as I can get the pivots lined up in the jewel holes on the top here, then I'm good to go. And so I'm gonna use a, 
a little plastic stick here to kind of help apply a minimal amount of pressure and guide where that bridge goes so that I can get the pivots in the jewel holes, which I think I've done. Yeah, there we go. So that prep work paid off because otherwise you're jiggling around the wheels and stuff after the fact. And then often you have to start over again and, and all that kind of stuff. So now I think I can put this thing in place. There we go. It takes a little bit of uh, angle to get it into place there, but it looks like it works out fine. Okay. Now we'll tighten down this bridge. Okay, so things are coming along. Does this uh, transfer power? Yeah, and it's moving much more freely now as well, so that's good news. As that wasn't happening before. And then I guess I can put this intermediate, intermediate wheel in place as well. I don't, I don't really need to because that's going to be part of the automatic works a little later, but I don't, why not? And now I can secure this uh, shim plate thing that goes in between. And again, this one's reaching over and being part of what holds down the, uh, the crown wheel as well. It's a bizarre setup, but you could tell that the engineers kind of figured out that they could use a screw to hold down two things at once and really kind of like that idea. <laughs> Interestingly, that isn't done very much on modern watch movements. I think each screw is a little more specialized now. Okay, so now I can replace the click. And again, that third screw also does go all the way down through the plate to help hold down this uh, barrel bridge. And now we can turn the movement over and start with the keyless works. The keyless works is uh, a really important part of the watch, though it doesn't uh, have anything to do with timekeeping, which is kind of interesting. Like you, your watch could just not have the keyless works and still technically keep perfect time. What it has to do with is uh, the way that we interact with the watch. And the two things that you do, uh, you know, physically with the watch is one, you have to wind it. In this case, it's an automatic. So it has uh, automatic winding, but you can also manually wind, as I said before. And then the other one is, of course, you need to set the time. You need to be able to change the time if you don't wear the watch for a while or if it gets out of sync or something like that. And the keyless works is the mechanism that allows you to do both of those things on the same watch. It's also interesting because it, you might be wondering, well, why is it called the keyless works? Uh, it's, it's not common to name something uh, like for, for something that's not there. Right. <laughs> uh, but the reason is, is because on old pocket watches, you used to have to carry around a little key and the key would wind up the watch and then on a separate spot would set the, the hands. And when they got around to inventing a watch that didn't need to have a key anymore, they, they called it keyless. And the part that did that is the keyless works. So it's kind of a relic, a relic of a relic. Okay, a little bit of uh, grease here for the uh, for the stem and crown. And now we can put the setting lever into place as well. This is always a little bit of a tricky operation. You have to kind of use your finger or something to hold down the setting lever on the other side and then flip it over and then screw from the top. And then what will happen is it'll it'll the threads will grab the setting lever and then you can tighten down, but it's a little bit tricky to do so. I did it, and uh, now I can put in the yoke and the infamous yoke spring, otherwise known as the born to fly spring. Ha ha, but not today, but not today. Yeah, I, I like to use that, that black pointer stick there to secure that type of spring so that it reduces the chance that it could fly away. Now we can put on the setting lever spring. And that's actually the last part of the keyless works that we need. There's still that cover plate that covers up the minute wheel, but technically that's part of the motion works. Motion works job is to uh, run the hands.
the hands of the watch. All right, there's that cover plate I was just talking about a minute ago. So let's get that put on before we do anything else, just so the minute uh, wheel doesn't come off. Plus, it's so fit. Look how tiny these screws are. I, these are just the smallest ones on the movement. Okay, but before we flip the movement back over, I do need to lubricate the keyless work, specifically where the setting lever and the setting lever spring meet, because that's under a lot of tension. And so you really do need to put some grease in there to make sure that it operates smoothly and also that it operates for a long time. I've put a little too much grease on here, so I'm gonna use some Rotico to remove the excess. <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing, but flipping the movement back over, I just realized that I forgot to screw down. <laughs> How many of you noticed that on the other side? To screw down the, uh, <laughs> the train wheel bridge. It's on pretty securely, so it wasn't an issue, but like, Probably should have done that before I flipped the movement over. Anyway, moving along, uh, now it's time to reassemble the uh, automatic works. And that means putting the parts for it in a, in a kind of a lubricant slash cleaner called Lubetta, which is a combination of the two. You put it in there and leave it for a little while and it'll clean the parts, but also leave a lubricating kind of film on them. And I've noticed here, look at these tiny little parts. So these little curved metal parts go inside of these reversing wheels and they act as kind of a shim inside of there so that the wheels can turn one way and not the other and as long as they're opposite. But that means I have to replace them. I didn't even know that they were part of the deal until this point. And uh, yeah, but it looks like they fit in there and then I can just place these reversing wheels back on top here. And thanks to that Lubetta, you know, since they are mildly oiled, those little parts are staying in. So it allows me to actually do this. And then this is a bridge or a cover plate that kind of holds those two wheels in place. Okay. And just a quick check to make sure that things are spinning and it looks like they are. I can do some oiling here as well of the jewels. Just a little bit of my 9010 it's called, the, the oil that we use for these. It's the lowest viscosity, highest viscosity, whatever. It's the thinnest of the oils. Okay, I guess I'll put on the uh, automatic winding works now. because we're getting pretty close now to seeing if this watch is actually gonna be able to run. Um, I was able to source basically an entire movement for this watch off of eBay and use the balance from that to see if I can get this thing running. And if that was the only issue. Because there, there is some reason why that balance was removed. Okay, we gotta put the pallet fork in place. We have to make sure, there we go, that it's actually seated correctly. And then we can screw down the pallet bridge here. Okay, I can put a wind in the watch and this is the, uh, the balance that I had gotten. <laughs> Let's see if it's gonna work. Okay, oh, a little bit of life there. Hmm. Okay, no, it's not going. Weird, why doesn't it wanna go? I think we need to investigate a little bit further here and see if we can see if maybe something's not right with the escape wheel or, wait a minute. Wait a minute, take a look at this. So this is the pallet fork that I just took out 
and I have the pallet fork from the donor movement here and look at them side by side. Do you see what the issue is here? <laughs> look at the bottom part. It's completely bent on the left one. Do you see that bend? That is like, I've never seen damage like that on a pallet fork. And that explains why what happened here most likely, which is that this watch probably took a very, very heavy shock, meaning a fall, a drop, a throw, you know, at the window of a car. I mean, it bent the pallet fork and somehow didn't break it, which is very, very strange. But what it means is I can go ahead and try the pallet fork from the donor movement. And we'll see if it wants to work. Again, I want to give it a wind here to make sure that when I install the balance to see if it'll actually work, that it you know has some power in it. That part looks fine. The pallet fork's reacting the way I would hope. I'm going to use the balance from the other movement as well. And I'm going to just clean it up really quickly here in some... Um, solvent and this will you know remove any debris or anything just to make sure because this balance hasn't been ran in so long and it needs to be cleaned and let's see if i can get this thing going come on come on come on come on come on it wants to it feels like it's not seated correctly again come on oh there it goes it is running again. We have a running watch yet again. The most beautiful sight you could hope to see, especially for a watch that didn't even have a balance when it arrived and it runs yet again. Oh my God, I'm so thrilled to see this watch running. You can't help but think of the owner when this part happens, right? That it's like, now the way is clear, right? I'm going to be able to get this thing going. I'm going to be able to get this thing back on the owner's uh, wrist again. And after some extensive fiddling, this is what I came up with. So the rate is epic. Fantastic. Zero seconds a day. You can't ask for better than that. The beat error could be a little bit better, but for watches like this, I won't go in and fix it because it's too risky for that level. And yeah, you know, interestingly... The, um, the amplitude's a little lower than I'd like, but still quite acceptable. And uh, we are going to move forward with this build with a watch that is now somehow keeping excellent time. I I'm a little surprised because I I'm pretty sure this watch took a major hit that took out the pallet fork and the um, balance. And I also replaced the uh, escape wheel on this watch too, just to be safe because those things all touch each other. So if something hit really hard down there and knock the jewel out, by the way, of the balance, um, I wanted to make sure that there was nothing that could be bent or damaged otherwise. Wow. Really awesome to get this thing going again. Now uh, we're back on the other side of the movement because the calendar works needs to be reassembled. And that big gold wheel at the bottom there is actually the one that turns over the calendar. It, it actually touches the calendar wheel, disc itself and turns it over. There's a little tiny post that sits up on it right next to the screw in the middle. And when that turns around, it touches the inside part of this uh, disc and turns it over once per day, ideally. Okay, so let's get this disc put into place. And just test it real quick to make sure that that little thing, there, there, there we go. Yeah, it moved it over. I'm just holding it in place because the dial will do that naturally, but otherwise it can just get pushed up. And I guess I just put this dial on back the way I had it via friction. I just sort of place it over the front and let's see if it works. There we go. And with that all set, we can now uh, get to putting the hands back on. As you see, I've set the calendar to the 8th, and that lets me know that it's midnight, and that's what time I need to set the hands for uh, specifically on this watch. So I'll start, of course, with the hour hand here. There we go. So that's the hour hand. Now the minute hand can go on. I love that Tudor Rose, by the way. I, that design element is so cool. 
I mentioned it before, but they did actually carry that design element forward with some of their more modern watches. Tudor's very much going strong. They had a line of kind of retro watches that came out called the Black Bay series that were really, really, will, were and are really, really popular. Okay, now the second sand can go on. Okay. Now I can test the hands um, and the calendar. So I'm just gonna spin it around until the next day officially starts, which is at midnight. Pretty dang close, couple of minutes short there, but that's totally acceptable. And uh, now we can turn our attention to the case of the watch. So first I need to remove the gasket inside of the crown tube here, which yes, came out quite nicely. Thanks to this kind of weird dental pick thing that I found. And now I need to remove the gasket that's inside the crown. Now, both of these gaskets, of course, will aid in keeping the watch as water resistant as we can get it. This gasket looks like it's a little bit more broken up. It's kind of coming out in chunks here. Let's see if I can get, yeah, uh, yeah, it's breaking off a little bit. That's okay though, it'll, it'll come out. There's a good chunk of it. Yeah, but it breaks. And as you can see, that gasket's completely worn out. It's lost its ability to uh, to bounce back. And so that means I'm gonna put in a new gasket. Um, you can see the gasket cleared out of there. I am gonna throw this in the ultrasonic before I put in the new gasket. So we'll do that in just a minute. But for now, I found a new crystal for the watch. This is a uh, called a Cyclops crystal, the ones that have that little magnifying glass on the side for the date that Rolex and, and Tudor have made so popular way back in the day. And the way it works is you put the crystal over the edge there and then the bezel sits over that and the bezel will squeeze down on the crystal to make it watertight. But in order to do so, we need to press it into place. So I'm gonna use my Rober press, it's called. It's a, Rober is a French company that makes these presses and watch gently. There we go. As the bezel is fully seated, it will, uh, keep that crystal in its place and take a look at that. That looks way better <laughs> than it did before. I'm not gonna do any um, case work on this watch. Um, Jose really liked the idea of the patina on it and how it looks and I agree 100%. So that I'm not gonna be doing any polishing or anything. So this is the gasket that does go into the uh, the crown that I just took out a minute ago. And I'm gonna put some silicone grease on it so that it has a little bit better uh, water prevention and also keeps it lasting longer, keeps it pliable and supple as it should be. And so I can just use my tweezers to gently place it inside. And then I also, of course, need to replace the crown tube gasket. Most of these Rolex and uh, Tudor watches have three gaskets. They have these two and then the one that goes on the case back. And that's how they make an oyster, as they call it. Okay, so I just need to kind of gently maneuver this gasket into place. It's a little bit tricky, but there you go. Now you can see that it's all seated nicely. And I can use an air blower here to make sure that there's no debris on the dial or on the underside of the uh, crystal. Ooh, that's looking really good. And uh, at least at the time, uh, Tudor used the same system that Rolex does to put the uh, movement back in the case, which is one where you kind of give it a quarter turn to get it into place, and then I can replace the, uh, the crown and the stem as well. Make sure that everything's all lined up and working properly. There we go. And once it is, then I can tighten down the case using the, the case screws there, and I can even tighten down the crown itself. Now, I do need to replace this automatic winding works because I did have to take it off to do some of the uh, extra work 
that we needed to do on this to get this watch running. And so I'm going to do that now. And it's held on by three screws. And just a quick check to make sure that it's engaged with the wheels and spinning, and it looks like it is. And now I've got a new gasket for the back. It's the same type of gasket that came on it. And I can just run, oop, there we go. Just run my finger around the edge to get it seated properly. And that will allow us to put on the case back, which by the way, look at that case back. I know it's just a simple one with numbers, but that that's the kind of wear that you just can't replicate. That's the type of wear that you get from having worn a watch for a long time or somebody did. And look at this thing now, <laughs> how incredible did this bad boy come out? I am so pleased with how this watch looks to me. This is what it's all about. This is the epitome of vintage watches. This is what I love about vintage watches, kind of a lesser known brand compared to like the super heavy hitters. You know, th this isn't some ultra sought after watch. I mean, it's not cheap, but you know, this isn't the type of thing that, you know, is going to be in a di display case. This Jose is going to wear this watch and that's why I restored it. And that's why he sent it to me. And I am really happy that we got to this point. And also, I'm really happy that he found this watch with this rose at the top that can remind him of his dearly lost friend, Rosie. And uh, hopefully he can wear this watch in good health. He did tell me that he welcomed his first child uh, this year. So congratulations to Jose and uh, that Rosie survived long enough to meet the child, and which I thought was a really great thing as well. That's going to do it for this video. I want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you want to find me on Instagram, I'm wristwatch underscore revival under over there. You can stop by and say hi. I'll post pictures of uh, in between project updates and stuff like that. But other than that, thanks so much for hanging out. We'll see you next time.